All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another chance to come before you and gather together as your children and learn your word. We appreciate this opportunity and the unity of the faith that we're able to have together, standing firm in the grace and truth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we ask for wisdom this evening, that your spirit guide us and direct us, that your spirit guide the speaker and the hearers to have us understand what you want us to understand this evening. And most of all, Father, we thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, out of heaven to become a man, to take our place of judgment once for all. We ask that you bless everything that goes on this evening. It's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. The Difficult Passages, the Gospels, Part 2. So Sunday was kind of a come-to-Jesus message to me, uh, in the sense that it was asking, you know, what are we doing, or what have we been doing? A uh, rubber-meets-the-road kind of message. For example, why did we ever wander off the path of simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ? By even overcomplicating the very scriptures that are meant to set us free and give us peace. You know, as, as we'll see later on in this message and as we saw on Sunday, if we're off track, if we're confused, etc., we, we did something wrong. Because God's Word is not designed to do that for us. So let's begin first tonight by reviewing the idea of knowing God and being known by Him. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Again, we talked about in the beginning on Sunday the idea of knowing God and being known by God. Through an intimacy unique to believers... We can know God, and more importantly, God knows us. And this language is really interesting how it's used in the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 8.1 Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Notice how knowledge and love are positioned against one another. Not that knowledge is a bad thing, but when it puffs up, it's a bad thing. And, you know, if you think you know the answers, you're not yet known as you ought to know. You don't yet know as you ought to know. But if you have love, or if you love God, then God knows you. He is known by him. So on the board, we saw this on Sunday regarding being known by him. In context, in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, refers to a special favor or approval of God and is reminiscent of Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, when he said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. So the same language is used. Again, in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So, how do we know that we love God? Go to John 14, verse 15. It says, If anyone loves God, he is known by him. So, how do we know we love God? Are we going to always have a, you know, tingly, goosebump kind of love? all the time for God? Are we always going to feel it? Like, is that what love is? There may be results like that at times, but look at John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So how do we know that we love God? There's one evidence. If you love me, you will keep my commands. How do we know that we've passed out of death into eternal life? How do we know that we're saved? 
Go to 1 John 3.14. 1 John 3.14. How do we know that we've passed out of death into life? How do we know that we love God? 1 John 3.14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. And he who does not love abides in death. Pretty simple. Pretty simple evidence, pretty simple test. And um, it's not some feeling. It's actually, for example, love is illustrated by obedience, by obeying his commands. So again, on the board, regarding being known by him, love is the great evidence that we know God and that God knows us. And it really is that clear, thank God. It's not supposed to be some mystery that we can't see. You know, the fruit is evident. The fruit is obvious even, as uh, 1 John says. Love is the great evidence that we know God and that God knows us. And while none of us has a complete, perfect love for God, believers have some portion of his love, as seen, for example, in obedience to his commands. Again, nobody has a complete, perfect love for God in this world, in this life, in this body. Not one. But believers will have some portion of it. And it's evidenced by, for example, obedience to His commands. And if you love God, God knows you. Thank God for that, huh? If you love God, God knows you. So Jesus won't say, I never knew you. If you love God, God knows you, as we just saw in 1 Corinthians 8, 3. So if God knows you this way, then you have a holy intimacy with him. This has come up the last couple lessons. This intimacy with God transcends natural things in this world. Totally transcends it. It rises above the things of this world, even the love in this world. And it includes the peace of God, which surpasses human comprehension. On the board, God is love. There's nothing more intimate and eternal than God's love. And we are able to experience his love supernaturally. The more we follow God, the more we obey, the more we learn, um, the more we're humble. We're able to experience his love supernaturally more and more. And this is different. It's supernatural. It's not, you know, any way that the flesh knows. Uh, Let's go to 1 John 4, verse 7. I don't think we went here on Sunday, but it tells the tale nice and clearly. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Is that terminology again. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that's what happens when you believe. When you really believe how much God loved you and you you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you understand how much He loves you. So that's what makes you love in return. Again, in verse uh, 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so again, in holy intimacy, love is the great evidence that we know God and God knows us. And the evidence that we love God is that we keep his commands and love the brethren. So that was just a little review of this concept of knowing God and God knowing us. Uh, Let's get back to our main topic, which is the difficult passages of the Gospels. We're called to live by faith one day at a time. But faith in what exactly? 
On Sunday, we encountered a lot of good questions to ponder as we go forward in living in the gospel. And one of the main questions on Sunday was this, regarding the word of Christ. Can you imagine embarking on a quest for faith, a faith that comes from hearing the word of Christ, according to Romans 10, 17, without first actually consulting the actual words of Christ himself? It seems like a foolish question, but many of us were trapped in that system of thinking. Can you imagine embarking on a quest for faith, a faith that comes from hearing the word of Christ without first consulting the actual words of Christ himself? Religion has taught many of us that we cannot read our own Bibles, for example. Religion has taught many of us that we don't really need or we can't understand the words of Christ himself. That's what's happened to us over the years in our walk, for many of us. On the board, different forms of religion have crept into our lives over the years that spoil the pure desire to learn from Christ and follow him. I can't tell you how many times over the years you know, as I was studying the Word, and uh, we'd be off on some tangents and, you know, some maybe deep topics or whatever, and you lose your way, you lose your peace even, because you're not talking about Jesus Christ and His words. And then how many times the subject matter came back to His person, you know what I mean? Came back to His person, talking about Him, talking about His words, talking about His commands or whatever, and then the peace came back. And why do we ever get so hung up in the weeds and the technicalities where we lose sight of his actual words? Really, looking back on it now, kind of blows my mind that we do that. But that's what religion does. It sneaks in and it kind of hijacks the pure desire, the pure form of worship that God wants us to have, which is to just, it's Jesus, it's his words, and follow him. So, is there anything more pure than simply following Jesus? How can we do that without focusing on his words in particular? Satan loves it when a person believes lies that keep them from spending any real time with the words of Jesus himself. And Jesus, as we heard on Sunday, again, he's the author and perfecter of our faith. How do you learn the faith when you don't follow the one that created the faith? In Hebrews 12, 2, Jesus is said to be the author and perfecter of our faith. And Hebrews is a letter to the church, to us, the church age, if you will. It's a letter to the church. And it says the author and perfecter of our faith. So how can we ignore or put aside his own words? the words of this author and perfecter, even in the church age, so to speak. How can we be mentored by the author and perfecter of faith by putting aside his direct commands or making them less important or even not for today? What a a subtle deception. You know, they're good, they're good, but we don't really need to focus on that today. And it's like, oh, okay. You know, the average sheep will say, okay, you must know what's going on. So as we saw last week, even Jesus, his own command to the church in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, when we finished the sentence, his own command was to teach them to obey all that I commanded. How do you teach somebody all that he commanded if you don't teach what he commanded? He said to the apostles, teach them what I commanded you. And that's what the apostles did in the letters. Look on the board again in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I believe that we've been delivered from this misconception over the past year or two, that we've gotten back to the source of our faith. And instead of picking and choosing 
what words of Jesus we're comfortable with. We're now embracing all things he said, and we accept them as part of the whole truth. We want the whole truth, don't we? Like the big picture, we don't want to cut anything out that shouldn't be cut out. If you do that, you lose sight of that big picture. You lose how perfectly the Word of God blends together, seamlessly. And the only reason we're confused on certain scriptures is because we're missing something of the big picture. So instead of picking and choosing what words of Jesus we're comfortable with, we now embrace all of his words and are set free by that because we accept it as part of the whole truth and it must fit in perfectly to the whole truth. The Spirit was very practical with us on Sunday. And uh, we talked about how it's funny that no one has a problem with the good things Jesus said. When I say good things, I mean easy things, right? The promises, like, you know, on the board, the Great Commission. Nobody has a problem with accepting that. Or like the verse on the board we saw on Sunday, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. No problem at all with that one. If people accept our Lord's edifying statements, then why do some people not accept his difficult statements? I think it's because we want to stay in control as mankind. We always want to be in control, and when we don't know something or understand it, we don't like it. So we make an excuse that it's not for today, for example. So we wrongly put aside the statements that challenge us, but that blend perfectly into the whole picture. So we talked about difficulty with the Gospels. The only reason the Gospels, which are those books that contain Jesus' words, the only reason they're difficult is because man has selective hearing. Arguably, the greatest attack on the Gospels from within so-called Christianity has been from hyper-dispensationalism. Hyper-dispensationalism. And the Spirit led Pastor to go back to our lessons three years ago now, to April of 2013, where there was a short series called Systematic Theology is Useful, but it has its place. And one thing in particular that systematic theology introduces is dispensationalism. And it really, when it goes out of proportion, can make you carve up the Word of God into so many little pieces that you separate things out that shouldn't be separated. And that's what some teachers have done over the years. Dispensationalism is one of those things that has grown its own wings over the years. It's morphed into something ridiculous and ugly because it's just gone too far. It's one thing to systematically organize teachings from the Word of God. In a sense, that's what systematic theology is. Systematically organizing teachings from the Word of God. But if man is not careful, they grow out of context. And how dangerous is that? Like some of the things we've been delivered from over the years, where you pluck one verse out of here, pluck one verse out of there, pluck one verse from here, and put them together and, and make this doctrine out of it. When there's single, singular verses from different books combined to make a, um, we might even say a theory, why, uh, why do those things lead us astray? Because they're taken out of context. And so that's the big danger. If man is not careful, even systematic theology that was meant for good originally can take things out of context and become overblown. So, for example, we're told in the Word of God to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Many of you have heard that scripture before. Rightly divide the Word of Truth. Not overly divide the Word of Truth. Rightly divide the Word of Truth. And some people have just taken it and run with it. And all of a sudden, we have all these delineations and lines in the sand that were never, ever meant to be there. So, for example, just to show you that verse, so you're all familiar with it, that phrase comes from 2 Timothy 2.15 in the King James Version. It's actually, that's not actually in the New American Standard, that, that wording, but it's a good translation. 
study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So over the years, systematic theology has unfortunately emphasized the word divide more than the word rightly, if you really step back and take a look at it. Rightly divide the word of truth, not overly divide it to an unhealthy place. We saw a few borrowed slides from our past lessons on systematic theology. The printing press and systematic theology the sharp rise in the science of theology, based on the sharing of ideas between notable theologians, is directly related to the printing press. This allowed theologians to build doctrines upon doctrines. And as Pastor mentioned, the issue became leaving the Word of God behind, just like the Jews did with the Mishnah. And I looked up a little basic information on the Mishnah, just to see what we can learn from it, and it really is a good example. We might say a bad example, something that we are following in, or many have followed in. The Mishnah was a written recording of the oral traditions of the Jews and their worship. They didn't want to lose, the Jews didn't want to lose their oral tradition. They didn't want to lose their, and you know how fond they are of tradition as a people, they didn't want to lose how they did things, and they wanted to write down everything including the oral tradition. So that, that was in this thing called the Mishnah. While the Jews may have had good intentions at first, it displaced the word of God itself as a top priority. So on the board, the Mishnah, according to Wikipedia, the term Mishnah originally referred to a method of teaching by presenting topics in a systematic order, as contrasted with the Midrash, which meant teaching by following the order of the Bible. The Mishnah, as a written compilation, accordingly orders its content by subject matter instead of by biblical context, as the Midrashim do. Notice, it orders its content by subject matter instead of by biblical context. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Even the word systematic is used in there. It was their form, we might say, of systematic theology. So the question must be asked, have we made the same mistake as the Jews? Is it possible that what pulled the Jews away so far that they didn't even recognize their own Messiah when he came? Is it possible that that's what did it over centuries, by the way? So you can see the danger, again, of getting away from biblical context. And today, with an overemphasis on systematic theology in many churches, many Christians sadly struggle with their own Messiah's words in the Gospels. Eerily similar. So back to the idea of dispensations. Uh, the, again, dispensations is what came from systematic theology. Everything started to be organized and put together and doctrine upon doctrine built upon itself. And dispensations was one thing that grew out of that, which really became something kind of dangerous. Uh, this was from Wiki Wikipedia on Sunday regarding dispensationalism. As a system, dispensationalism is rooted in Scripture and expounded in the writings of John Nelson Darby, who lived from 1800 to 1882, and the Plymouth Brethren Movement. So, again, keep this date in mind. We're in the mid-1800s at some point here when Darby developed this notion of dispensationalism. Where does it fall in the big picture of church history? Regarding systematic theology itself on the board, this type of Bible teaching has been progressing, quote-unquote, for centuries, becoming particularly popular in the last 100 to 200 years. Of particular noteworthiness is the extensive work of Lewis Sperry Schaefer in his Systematic Theology, published in 1947, whose spiritual heritage links through C.I. Schofield back to Darby. 
who again is the guy who was, we might say, the creator of dispensationalism. Now, this isn't an attack on any one man. This is a defense against false doctrines that have crept in and led thousands of people astray. Many intelligent men have just kept on writing in their attempt to rightly divide the word of truth, but it ended up being often to their own harm and the harm of others. The more we as mankind allow ourselves to keep on going, in other words, to keep on running with it, out of context, the more we get into trouble. And I, I mean, I'll say this again. I've said this a lot. I really believe the Spirit's put this on my heart as a reminder. God gave the Word of God to who? Who did He come for? The poor, the weak, the uneducated, right? The lame, the fishermen. He came for people that weren't going to be able to intellectualize it. So, what a mistake to go down that rabbit hole, if you will, to run, to run in that direction when it's supposed to be, in context, understandable to everybody. So again, the more we as mankind allow ourselves to keep running with it, the more we get into trouble. We need to stop intellectualizing the Word of God and just keep on reading our own Bibles in context. And the Spirit has shown us in this wonderful congregation of humble people, over the last couple of years, he's shown us the incredible power and freedom in keeping your Bibles and reading your Bibles in context. And it's set so many of us free by the grace of God. So regarding systematic theology, when we get carried away with systematic theology, we literally get carried away from the beauty of Scripture as it's found in context. If we don't hold on tightly to keeping Scripture in context, we will lose our way, as man has done throughout human history. Again, there's a place for everything, but when we get carried away with things like systematic theology, we literally get carried away from the beauty of Scripture as it's found in context. And in, only in context does it all fit together seamlessly. If we don't hold on tightly to keeping scripture in context, we will lose our way, as man has done throughout human history. So we were challenged on Sunday that we may have been entertaining the doctrine of demons. And it's funny, even when I saw this verse, uh, go to 1 Timothy 4, even when I saw this verse, I'm like, ooh, doctrines of demons. Like the first thing that comes to my mind is, is um, obvious evil. Right? Like some obvious evil message, but that's not what it's talking about. 1 Timothy 4.1 What do you think the doctrines of demons are? Are they obviously evil? Or are they sounding good? Are they tempting to believe? Are they, uh, does it include a lot of truth? It's what Satan does. 1 Timothy 4.1 but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, we also tend to think that latter times, at least again, this is my, my soul, so it's probably in some of your souls. Latter times, you know, it says last few years before Jesus comes back, right? That last few years, I don't know how many years we're close, the rapture might be coming, when you hear latter times, that's what I think of. But big picture analysis we saw on Sunday should make us maybe view it a little differently. We see here in this graphic the 6,000 years of mankind and the last 2,000 years since Christ as part of that. Dispensationalism represents about 3% of human history. Remember, Darby lived in the mid-1800s. Dispensationalism represents about 3% of all human history and about 10% of the time from Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. 
So is it possible that we might consider the facts on the board as being the latter times that Paul wrote about to Timothy that we just read in 1 Timothy 4.1? Is it possible that dispensationalism has morphed into something ungodly, although if kept simple, it does seem to be biblical, but is it possible it's morphed into something ungodly as part of the doctrines of demons in the last 200 years, which is, again, only 3% of human history? Is it possible that many doctrines of demons have used the platform of dispensationalism to spread lies? You see, if you accept one thing, if you accept dispensationalism, especially in its rigid format with a lot of breaks throughout human history, then you have to accept other things. You have to disqualify certain passages from being from certain errors or for certain errors. So once you buy into that, then everything else doesn't fit, so you have to make it fit. And that's what happens. It, it's possible that dispensationalism was used as a platform, you know, a foundation. If it's going to fit this foundation, then well, we've got to change some things around. Or it's not going to make sense. So again, when you hear the phrase doctrines of demons, don't think of obvious evil. Think of evil masquerading as good. That's doctrines of demons. Remember, Satan has a skill of closely counterfeiting truth. He's brilliant, and he knows how to add lies into the truth so that we don't even notice it. And he's done that to many of us over the years. But if we stay humble, as we've learned, if we stay humble and, and really want the truth, if we really seek for the truth and we keep the word of God in context, God will deliver us from those satan satanic deceptions. We can count on that as long as we stay humble. But again, doctrines of demons, they sound sweet to the ear, even to the Christian who is seeking truth. If he's not careful... Satan's lies that have been embedded are accepted as part of the truth. And things start getting uh, taken out of context. So on the board, the real danger is that contemporary Christian developments and men building doctrines upon doctrines upon doctrines, instead of continu continuing to just read their Bibles in context, that may have separated people from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I don't know about you, but I can see this very clearly now looking back. I could see exactly the situation, but it took the grace of God and a diligent pastor to work through it and to work through the Word of God and, and, and the simple purity of devotion to Christ. Again, the real danger is that contemporary Christian developments and men building doctrines upon doctrines upon doctrines, instead of just continuing to read their Bibles in context, that may have separated people from the true gospel or the full gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me pose to you a couple of questions here regarding this. Were the apostles lost on how to follow Christ because they didn't officially break things out into dispensations? Or were they freer and clearer on the message of Christ than anybody else? Did the Holy Spirit take care of that as they went forward following Christ and his words? Here's another question. For the first 1,800 years of the church, were they in the dark about Christ because they didn't have dispensationalism and systematic theology? It wasn't around for the first 1,800 years. Were they in the dark about Christ? I mean, there was a period called the Dark Ages, but that's because they didn't even have Bibles. But 1,800 years, no dispensationalism, no systematic theology. Did they not know, love, and follow Christ and even be martyred for their faith? Were they just simply following Christ and his words before man started to overcomplicate the Bible? Here's a simple good definition of what dispensationalism is biblically from Pastor John MacArthur. 
Dispensationalism is a system of biblical interpretation that sees a distinction between God's program for Israel and his dealings with the church. It's really that simple. And note, note, note the wording here. It's a, it's a system of biblical interpretation that sees a distinction. All right, there's a difference. There's a difference between Israel and God's plan for Israel and the church. There is a difference. How about we just leave it at that? Can we just leave it at that, people? Instead of running with it and intellectualizing it and, you know, wanting to write books and whatever. Who knows some people's motivation, but that's really all it is, and that's a true biblical principle. You know, some things are meant for Israel, some things are meant for the church. We don't sacrifice animals any longer today because the final sacrifice has come in the blood of Christ. Okay? That was for Israel. It's not meant for us any longer. Christ has changed things. Wonderful truth. But why can't we just leave it at that as mankind? Did we, even in this local assembly, have an incomplete gospel of Jesus Christ because of the simple fact that we were separated from the four gospels in the Bible? Hyper-focusing on the church letters of Paul. Did we lose sight of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of that? I think so. If you think about it, doing that is like taking the foundation out of a building. I mean, what do you expect? But for yourself to be confused, right? And for things to crumble. Paul was building on the Lord's gospel, not the other way around. And some people, including you know myself in the past, worshipped Paul's letters, if you will, and just kind of put the Gospels aside inappropriately, as not for today. And that's what happens when you're hyper. All right, Hyper is very rarely a good thing. To hyper-dispensationalize. To hyper-anything. To hyper-categorize the Word of God. You're asking for trouble. But because man loves to be in control, he will hyper anything, if given the chance. Even things that start out good or with good intentions. We love to overdo things. We love to overcook things because we want to be in control. And that, that takes humility to drop that, right? What is it when you want to be in control? Arrogance. So because you want to know everything and have everything in your boxes so you're not uncomfortable, you know, you, you force things. And what is that? Arrogance. So if we're just humble, again, we'll avoid these pitfalls. So why the confusion? Is it possible that because you had bought a lie that the Gospels and the words of Jesus were not for your dispensation, in full or in part, that this could be the major culprit in your confusion? I say yes for me. Think about it. Again, if we're confused, if we're confused with the Word of God, we're the ones that are doing something wrong. We're the ones that are coming at it from a wrong perspective somehow. All right? It has to be that way because the Word of God is pure and perfect, and the Holy Spirit's a great teacher. So we must be getting in the way somehow if it's confusing. As Pastor has often said to us, if we read our Bibles and you're fundamentally confused, something's wrong. I don't, it, that doesn't mean not understanding certain things that you read, you know, in particulars. It means fundamentally confused. If you're confused about the whole picture, the big picture, some, you're coming at it from the wrong angle. Something's missing. But if we stay humble and read our Bibles in context, we've seen how faithful the Spirit is in revealing things to us. So again, why the confusion? God is not interested in confusing his own children, especially regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. But of course, Satan is. Turn again to 1 Corinthians 14.33. 1 Corinthians 14.33. Satan does not want us to have peace. Even as believers who are already saved, he does, 
He'll do anything he can to disturb God from being glorified in our lives, and that includes taking away our peace. 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He's a God of peace. Go to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. So we know confusion is not from God. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's Satan's goal. Lead them astray. Let them run down that rabbit hole. Get, push them. Let them run with it. Let them think they have something as well at the same time. So back to our topic on difficult passages related to the gospel. Why do you think the first four books in the New Testament have been named and called out as the gospels? Long before any dispensationalism ever took root. Why are they called the gospels? Why were they always known as the gospels for 1,800 years? The gospels. They comprise the very one and only gospel of Jesus Christ. What better strategy could Satan put forth than to separate believers in the church from the very words of our Lord? Brilliant strategy. On Sunday, the Spirit showed us the continuity in the Bible regarding the gospel. So let's look at that again to remind ourselves how it's totally seamless throughout the New Testament. Go to Mark 1.1 again. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. The Spirit showed us the continuity in the Bible regarding the gospel. There's not more than one gospel. Mark wrote the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So on the board we saw this, the gospel of Jesus Christ from Evangelion, Jesus Christos refers to the good news about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, especially when you compare it with Romans 1.9. So again, in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Paul calls, quote-unquote, his gospel, the gospel of his Son, which is obviously the same thing. Go to Romans 1, verse 1. So Mark says it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and Paul says it's the gospel of His Son, which is obviously the same thing. Romans 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which He promised beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning His Son, who was born of a descendant, of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Again, in verse 9, For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of His Son. So let's remember the intimate beginnings of the early church. These gospels and letters, you know, so often we see the four gospels coming first in the New Testament, and we think of the letters as coming almost way after the gospels. And granted, Jesus lived to about 30 A.D., 
and then the letters were written to the church afterward. Okay, but when were the Gospels even written? They weren't written while Jesus was alive. They were written after he was resurrected, quite a few years after. So we know on Sunday we talked about how Mark wrote his Gospel somewhere in the 50s A.D. So over 20 years after the Lord died and was res resurrected, Mark wrote his Gospel about in the 50s. Paul wrote his famous letter to the Romans in about 56 A.D. So in the same decade, possibly even the same year, these two books were written, the Gospel of Mark and the letter of Paul to the Romans, possibly in the same year. Think about that. All these works that were written in the New Testament were written in a very close time-wise, and they were agreeing with one another and even often quoting each other. So we have one gospel that really matters, and they were all in perfect agreement on that. So on the board regarding the simplicity and purity of Christ, to both Mark, who wrote his gospel in the 50s, and Paul, who wrote Romans around 56 AD, and any and all writers of the New Testament, there wasn't some artificially dispensationalized viewpoint about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't separated out. There was not even a chance to separate it out. It was all one gospel being preached and all written about around the same time. Paul knew this and was never confused about it. If you read his epistles, you'll see that everything Paul wrote was to preserve the good name of the one Messiah, the one Savior, and the one gospel. So we have to ask ourselves, again, why the confusion? If the gospel was never confusing to the writers of the New Testament, why in the world would it be confusing to us now? The answer is easy. The doctrines of demons that have crept in. To interrupt the continuity of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to violate the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Go there again. To interrupt the continuity of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to violate the whole Bible. Think about it. The four gospels are in the center of the Bible. The Old Testament was leading up to the reality of the Messiah coming and, and his gospel being preached. And then after the resurrection, the letters are written looking back on Christ and his life and his commands, his words. He's the center of it all as it should be. So look at 1 Corinthians 10.1. Here we see Paul elevating Christ as the source of the gospel. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and that rock was Christ. Paul goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Forget going back just to the Gospels or to Mark's words, he says this, this rock, this Christ, has always been the same yesterday, today, forever. It's the same gospel that was preached, Old, New Testament, on the board, the same spiritual drink. Old Testament saints were not made alive by another gospel from another spirit. It's always been the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus hadn't come yet, but it was still the good news about the Christ. Paul speaks of this idea of a different gospel in 2 Corinthians 11. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> so there we see there's one spiritual rock for all time. One gospel of Jesus Christ. But there is a different gospel he mentions which we have to be on guard for, 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, 
For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Notice the phrase, a different gospel. For Paul to call out a different gospel, it means it's not as the same as the original one. Just that very terminology. If there is a different one, well, there must be one we're comparing it to. Not two, not three. There's one true gospel, and Paul, on the board, was afraid that the doctrines of demons would successfully split the simplicity, purity, and unity of the one true gospel. To Paul, there was always just a single gospel. And again, as we heard on Sunday, remember, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament scriptures better than anybody. It's not like he overlooked something. He's saying this was always the gospel. Jesus was always the rock. And he continues to be, even in the letters I write. Paul's gospel was just an extension of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's again close with some practical thoughts on all of this that we saw on Sunday. First of all, regarding selective hearing. Why would we ever choose to listen to some of Jesus' words, but not all? Romans 10, 17 again. Context is indeed key. However, man has manufactured unholy contexts in order to write off the words of our very Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as desired. Take a look at Romans ten seventeen before we close. How can we listen to some of Jesus' words, but not all? Even when the New Testament letters tell us we should be focusing on the words of Christ. Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Not the word of Paul, the word of Christ. So on the board, we are to listen to the Spirit. Since the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ Himself, as in Romans 8, 9, and this same Spirit inspired the Word of God, such as in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, and 13, and 2 Timothy 3, 16, we know that the whole Bible reflects the Word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. Go to Romans 8, verse 9. We're talking about the Spirit of Christ involved in everything. Romans 8, 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Again, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ, and this same Spirit inspired the Word of God. Go to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. As we close, we all as sinful, corrupted mankind need to just get out of the way of the pure things of God. 
We need to stop being hyper about things. Stop overcooking everything. And stop inserting ourselves artificially where we don't belong. What's our job? What's our role? Be humble before God and His Word. Listen to the Spirit. That's our place. Be humble. Submit to the Word of God and listen to the Spirit. And God does all the work. So on the board, the more we get in the way, the more work we make for ourselves. Isn't that the irony of it all? We're the ones that cause ourselves more pain, more work, more confusion. The more we get in the way, the more work we make for ourselves. And the more we get away from doing God's work of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians 2, verse 10, and we'll close there. Actually, let's start in verse 8. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Isn't that beautiful? What's our job? Walk in them. Anyone can walk. But He prepared the works even beforehand, even before we were created. So again, on the board, the more we get in the way, the more work we make for ourselves, and the more we get away from doing God's work of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank You so much for the truth and clarity of the Scriptures and that Your Holy Spirit gives to us as we humbly follow You and follow Your Word. We ask, Father, that You bless these things to our soul, help us understand these things personally, to reconcile them in our own hearts as truth so that we can go on in freedom as You intended. And Father, help us take all these things out to a lost and dying world that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Christ's precious name, and it's by the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen. Thank you.